So we are joined here today with uh, Sanjay Rupralia, Assistant Professor of Politics in the New School for Social Research and uh, author of his recently published book, Divided We Govern, Coalition Politics in Modern India. This is from Oxford University Press, came out at the end of 2015. And we're going to ask Professor Rupralia to tell us a little bit about his book, some of his research here at the New School, and uh, a little bit more about Indian electoral and coalition politics. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks. So if I can start out, your book is a pretty detailed look at Indian electoral politics and coalitions. Yeah. Uh, what got you interested in this topic? Um, it's a little, bit of a long journey. So I first got interested uh, in India quite late, actually. So I, when I was a student first, um, I did a lot of courses in political theory, intellectual history, um, international relations, and the one region of the world that I probably studied the most as an undergraduate was uh, actually Eastern Europe and post-Soviet Union. This was the early 90s. Yeah. I'm dating myself. <laughs> and, um, and that's what everybody was reading at the time, and particularly transitions from socialism to capitalism and democratization. So I got really interested in those kind of questions. But as uh, time went on, I sort of found myself really interested in the problems of um, governing complex societies, mm -hmm. sort of particularly large territories with big populations. India fits well. India fits well. So I started thinking about you know China, India, Nigeria, Brazil, these kinds of places. Um, and when I started my graduate studies in Cambridge, it's, India still wasn't on the scanner actually, mm -hmm. in, in a funny way because I'm of Indian origin. And I've been regularly traveling to India since I was a kid, I kind of wanted to do something different. Um, so I sort of thought I would actually wanted to work on Brazil, um, which is actually a place that I'm now trying to learn much more about and teach about a bit. Um, but the program when I was there uh, didn't really have, it was a much shorter program, didn't have much scope for language training, I didn't speak any Portuguese, <laughs> so it was a bit difficult. And, and, and so I sort of gravitated towards studying India only at the end of my master's. Okay. Um, and, and I actually just became fascinated by it. Um, because a lot of the questions I was interested in were about democracy, secularism, uh, nationalism, uh, and the whole prospect of development right, in what we now call the Global South, but was still called well, at least developing world, if not third world. And India was just seemed like a great place, despite the fact that I was of Indian origin mm -hmm. and had been visiting it, just it seemed like an amazing country in the mid-90s when I started to study it. Um, to look at those questions, and it was going through a series of really important changes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I sort of got interested in India. And the question about electoral politics was really that, well, I guess there are a lot of striking things about India, but the one that really stood out to me as a student then, because people started to write about it, was that here was this country that shouldn't have been a democracy. If you read Western political theory uh, or its history, uh, you know, because when it became a democracy, it was a poor agrarian country. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of its citizens were illiterate, and yet, at one go, uh, it was given adult suffrage. Right. Which, and it, if and you argued, argued, was an important move. Yeah, and and it was so. It's, it's an astonishing, astonishingly radical thing to do. And not only did it work in the sense that democracy survived the first two or three decades when people thought it was going to collapse. Um, but by the time I started getting interested in India in the mid-90s, uh, a really interesting process had begun where um, lots of citizens who came from more disadvantaged sections of society were actually voting in higher numbers than their social betters, which we had not sort of seen anywhere in the world. It was almost the inverse of what you see in the United States or Western Europe, mm -hmm. where the more socially privileged tend to vote more right. uh, in higher numbers. So that was happening in India, what some analysts call the second democratic upsurge, okay. as I mentioned in the book. So it was just a really fascinating time. There was a lot of turmoil, there was a lot of churning. I was uh, in increasingly interested in the left, mm -hmm. and that's what these coalitions, uh, which are the subject of the book, uh, they were the ones that came to power. So that was the sort of root, of sort of interested in sort of difficulties of governing, yeah. large, uh, diver deeply diverse democracies. Um, lots of issues in India that you could study. <laughs> sort of Certainly. fascinating, um, and it was also just the timing of it. I think the mid-90s were a period of great uh, kind of political tumult. Mm -hmm. um, and not and even just for India, but for much yeah. of the world. Yeah, 
And so that's how I got interested in it. And uh, I never thought I would end up writing a book like this because a lot of it is like you know very fine grained analysis about political institutions and things like that. Um, and how they work, you know, is, is it a parliamentary government, is it federal, what kind of electoral system to have. I used to have um, a really sort of, out of pure ignorance, a sort of almost like a disdain for those kinds of topics, because I'd done a lot of political theory, and I thought that were much bigger, deeper questions. Yeah. But I got taught very quickly by both scholars in India, but also journalists, politicians who I was meeting, that you just couldn't understand great democratic questions that were taking place without doing this kind of a study. Well, that was one of the things I found interesting is you, you, in a certain sense, take to tax some of the more traditional positivist or certain comparative political theories that say, we can create this very nice, clean theory that can be generalized everywhere and that's much more useful than a, a nitty-gritty ethnographic historical account. But you push back against that and you argue actually that that misses a lot. Why do you think that's the case? Well, I guess there's sort of two motivations. One was, um, which is not really academic, it's personal, is that I think for a long time I really struggled between trying to decide what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You know, did I want to actually work in politics? Did I want to, uh, did I want to try to become a journalist, mm -hmm. sort of investigative journalist, or did I want to become an academic? And in, in a funny way, the book was a way of trying to, not very, not fully consciously, but trying to resolve those tensions. So, you know, it's a sort of very thick narrative mm -hmm. of the high politics of India, yeah. of successive governments. Um, and so that kind of, all those three interests and tensions got resolved. Um, but I think, I'm not averse to sort of, uh, you know, how would I put it? I think there's a lot to learn from comparative theories mm -hmm. of politics, and I teach them. Right. And that's what I was taught as well. But I thought for this particular project that I was interested in India, um, the theories that I was reading mm -hmm. didn't fit very neatly upon India. Right. And I wanted to tell an Indian story. So I had to really dig into history and narrative and really try to uncover how processes unfolded. Um, so I, I think that, you know, it partly was, it was sort of driven by the case. Mm -hmm. um, if I look back on it now, I mean, the topic, the analysis, the method, it's not like I walked in saying, I want to write a book like this. Mm. You know, I really didn't know. It was very much sort of an act of discovery. And it was very much really driven and determined by what I, what I found in the field. So I sort of went to India armed with all my theories, and I thought I understood Indian politics extremely well. And I was really disabused with the notion within two weeks, because I landed in the middle of an election. Um, <laughs> Good time for your topic. Great time for my topic. Uh, I mean, it's a real kind of carnival, right, in India, because it lasts weeks and weeks uh, spread across the country. Um, and it's an incredibly intense kind of political atmosphere during elections. But what really struck me was when I started doing sort of informal interviews with journalists, just talking to them. That's what scholars are interesting, but journalists and some politicians I met before I started interviewing bureaucrats, they basically looked at me and they said, you know, those models don't help really explain what's going on here. Um, and I have to say, I was also partly trained by um, my supervisor, came to somebody named Jeffrey Hawthorne, who's written many different things. But uh, what unites a lot of his work, and Cambridge as a school generally is quite suspicious of theory. Mm. And so in some ways it's almost the inverse of the new school. Um, they, they tend to be suspicious of, of theory, and in terms of, of as, as if theory could be a key that would unlock all of the puzzles and mysteries of politics. So there's a real emphasis on history, on understanding, mm. and I, I obviously sort of a lot of that seeped in. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that uh, struck me as both fascinating and at times challenging was trying to keep track of which party fractured and then reformed and is this the new independent version of this party or is this the coalition that split but then is reformed, particularly within the socialist and communist parties but also some of the others. How do you as a scholar try to keep track of all of this as you're working on both in the field but then writing later? It's really hard. I mean, one of the reasons it took me so long to write the book in terms of letting it go was, um, I mean, a book like this hasn't been, when, when I first began this, when I first arrived in the field, I met a very eminent um, political scientist of India, somebody named Rajini Kothari, mm -hmm. um, who's really sort of formed the field in India for, for several decades. And he belonged to the Gandhian socialist tradition that I write about. And he said to me, and I knew nothing, I mean, I sort of look back now, I was completely ignorant, I didn't, I didn't have a clue. So, read 10 books on India and thought I understood its politics. 
and he said, you know, you should write, you should write a history of the Socialist Party, which I wasn't interested in doing at that point. And I started looking around, and you, you didn't, and I said, why would he ask me to do that? And I said, well, because there actually aren't many histories you could read about at that point. And the reason was, it was because of the politics you described, it, it's incredibly difficult, because it's a very, uh, it's an incredibly complicated history of splits and mergers and resplits and remergers and, uh, you know, the, I, you will have read, right, the, the, there's something like six pages of abbreviations yeah. at the beginning of the book. Lots of acronyms. Um, so many acronyms. Too many acronyms. <laughs> and that's partly why it's, it, Indian politics has sort of developed that way. It's very difficult to write. So if it was difficult to write it, and I know it, one of the things I worried about was that it's not an easy read. Mm -hmm. So I really put a lot of effort into being as clear uh, about the politics yeah. as I could be. Um, but I think some of it is just inherent to the subject. Right. It's, it's, it's just a very difficult politics to explain. And as I was writing it, uh, I found it difficult to write myself. Mm -hmm. I actually started writing other pieces that I found much easier. So like one of the first pieces ever was on Hindu nationalism mm -hmm. as a paper, because it just looked very easy. There was a party, there was a movement, and we can explain it. And the, the broader Indian left had two main traditions, and within those traditions had multiple parties that had split, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. not to mention the movements that were lied to. Mm -hmm. And it's just much more difficult. So it's it, it's a tough, it's a, I know it can be a tough read, and I just sort of did my best to try to make it as accessible um, as I could. You know. I mean, the challenge for me was thinking about, you know, here in the United States right now, or in the lead up to the presidential elections, and there's lots of discussions <coughs> about uh, U.S. politics. But when we talk about socialist or communist politics here, it means something very different than what's going on in India. So. Can you give us a little sense of why do socialist and communist parties seem to still have, not just in India, but in South Asia, seem to have much more popular support today? Um, what were you finding in your research? <clears throat> well, the, that's a big question. So you know, the, the broader left in South Asia was very important to the anti-colonial movement, mm -hmm. right from the 19. 20s. Um, so, and they're, t they're developed quickly, there's sort of two traditions, the communists and the socialists. They tried to unite in the early bit, as I described in the book, in the 30s. They couldn't because of some basic disagreements. Um, and <clears throat> so I think part of the reason why they're, why they can, well, part of the reason they were part of the anti-colonial movement, and, and the Congress Party itself had a wing of the party that was sort of a left Congress, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was sort of, there was, there was a lot of affinity between left members of that Congress and some of these, although they belonged to different parties and ultimately disagreed about important matters. So part of it's sort of a long sort of historical legacy of mm -hmm. the left playing an important role in the anti-colonial movement. Part of it, I think, has to do with, with Indian democracy, the fact that it is genuine, right? Mm -hmm. So when people said, uh, how could these communist parties actually play a role? So the first time a communist government is elected in India is in 1957 in Kerala. And under controversial circumstances, it's dismissed before it ends its term. But then it comes back to power in the late 60s. Um, and then there is a, a radical Maoist wing of it that breaks away, which Indian state crushes quite brutally in the 70s. But then from the late 70s, you've seen communist parties in power in two, three states in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh, West Bengal, Kerala, Tripura, and in one famously, or infamously, if you're an opponent of the communists, you know it was in power for 34 years, mm -hmm. won successive elections. It's kind of extraordinary, and I think that, in a sense, is a testament to the fact that this was a genuine representative democracy mm -hmm. that the communists could actually struggle for power within it. Um, initially, they didn't. They thought that independence was a sham, as mm -hmm. they famously said, and so they tried to pursue a sort of Chinese path of insurrection which the state you know, brutally put yeah. down. But, you know, as I think it's part of it is that, um, part of it is the sort of long-term historical legacies that are playing out. Part of it, of course, is also the fact that it is still the most populous, poor democracy in the world, mm -hmm. in the sense that, of course, there, it has grown tremendously in the last three decades. There's fabulous wealth in the country now as well. Um, it's a very um, complex economy. but. There's still, of course, whether you look at cleavages of class, caste, mm -hmm. language, region, lots of inequalities. And so in a sense, it's a natural home for left parties to thrive. In fact, 
uh, you would you might say that the, the natural center of gravity in India should be mm -hmm. left of center politics. So that raises a different kind of question, which is, you know, why have Hindu nationalists, for instance, become mm -hmm. increasingly important since the mid-1980s? Um, so the communist movement was very important uh, in the 50s and 60s in terms of the popular vote. So were the socialists. So the combined vote of both movements, but again, as you already noted, there are multiple parties that splintered the vote. But if you were to combine the total vote, it's about 20% of the vote. So it's a lot. Yeah. But, but they were often quite regionally sequestered. Mm -hmm. So the socialists tended to be in what's called the Hindi heartland, mm -hmm. in the states of what we now are called today, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, right? Um, in the north, in the Hindi, in the, Gang in the Gangetic Plains. The communists were, had, did have footholds there, but were quickly pushed out by the socialists and other forces, and ended up getting footholds in West Bengal and Kerala in the south, and Tripura in the, in the northeast. In many of the other states, you did have what most scholars call today sort of more populist parties. Mm -hmm. So in the state of Tamil Nadu, you have what's called the DMK, the AIA DMK. They have lot, there are some progressive aspects to their politics. They take a more populist mm -hmm. character. Same thing in Andhra Pradesh. Generally in the South, these parties are kind of unusual parties because on the one hand, they're quite socially populist, mm -hmm. but they also are the home of regional capitalists. Mm -hmm. You know, so it 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 sort of it makes for quite interesting Strange politics. Yeah. yeah. So you know, you so the so the parties of Tamil Nadu, for instance, um, were the ones that innovated, um, you know, highly subsidized foods food schemes, mm -hmm. for instance, in a way which had a dramatic effect on poverty. But those same parties were also the the sort of vehicles for regional capitalists mm -hmm. to ascend. So they're quite complicated, interesting politics in the South. So I would think what I would say is a federal system, um, it's a centralized federal system, but over time because of processes of regionalization that I've sort of described, but also then some institutional changes, right? And particularly with liberalization, there was a, a devolution of power de facto to the states. Um, it's created these arenas where new parties can emerge. And the thing to always remember, as you said, right, that it's the size of these states are huge. They're nation states for most of the world. Even if you kind of throw away all the ones like your party and I'm a party, yeah. you still have something like 50 parties. Yeah. You have today. You have you have something like 35 or 40 parties in parliament, mm -hmm. like real parties. Yeah, which is hard to imagine. I mean, they're not great organizations, but but they're like genuine parties. Yeah, they're still registered. You can vote. 35. Yeah. Right. So like, how are you supposed to keep track of? <laughs> right. So <clears throat> when you take a state like Gujarat in the West. It's upwards of 40 million people, yeah. right? So how many European states are that large? If, if, you, if you take Bihar, it's over 100 million people, yeah. right? So it, I, what happens is when you have that kind of magnitude, um, that kind of diversity, you you would almost expect there to be a, a diversity of parties, mm -hmm. and um, so there are some institutional reasons for that to happen. There are some sociological reasons. Mm -hmm. So I often find sometimes when I'm trying to teach India, it's very hard to grasp just how uh, how diverse the, the polity can can be and sometimes I try to use the analogy imagine if you had the European Union today become a state a single polity where like the European Parliament was the only parliament you would have socialists in Portugal you'd have socialists I'm going the other way around socialists <laughs> in Sweden socialists in Portugal they might all be socialists but you would suspect the socialists in Portugal all except for right espousing certain principles of egalitarianism so on and so forth they're going to be a different party if not least because they also have their own intellectual traditions in a different language in which they pursue these politics than the socialists of Sweden. Now they're both socialist parties. So sim similar thing sort of happens in India, right? So the, the Communist Party, it's, a, it's very much a Leninist party in India, the Communist Party of India, Marxist. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, but, but you know, the character of the party in Kerala is quite different mm -hmm. from the character of the party in West Bengal. Mm -hmm. And in, in some ways, you would expect it. These are two quite different states, different histories, different sociologies, and um, and so I think, in that sense, the system uh, allows, facilitates, encourages, sometimes even demands, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And that's why the Congress Party, over time, has found it more and more difficult to retain its national presence, which it had during the anti-colonial movement, across the country, because you have to have a party which has 
provincial units and leaders that can appeal to the citizens right. of these distinct states in their languages, in their idiom. And that's, that's a very hard yeah, thing to do. I mean, do you think with the rise of um, Modi and the sort of the re... Um, I mean, not really the resurrection of the BJP, since they've always been key partners, but kind of the more dominance now in contemporary politics. Do you see that as a rejection of the left parties that you say have, in some sense, failed to really do good <coughs> coalition politics in the late 80s and 90s, or do you think there's other trends also at work there? So the BJP, as a party, the party of the Hindu National, like you said, it was there from independence, but it really became a force. Um, it started to become a force in the mid-70s, actually by joining hands with the socialists. Yeah. Um, More strange bedfellows. Or not. <laughs> or not. There, there are some things that united them, and one of them had to do with the importance of Hindi, mm -hmm. um, a certain view towards religion, yeah. uh, you know, that uh, the communists sort of would see sort of, right, your religion is your obscure tanism and so on and so forth. Yeah. The, the socialists in the Gandhian tradition didn't. So there were certain alliances that could take place between the socialists left and the Hindu right. But there was always there were always tensions, as I sort of document in the book. Um, victory of Modi, I think, was due to a number of factors. Right, some of them are short term. He he was quite an extraordinary campaigner. Mm -hmm. I um, I don't uh, I don't support his politics, but just to study him as a political scientist, he's quite an extraordinary politician, quite an extraordinary story. Mm -hmm. um, so he was an incredibly effective campaigner. <clears throat> he turned the contest into a presidential one and pitted himself against opponents who really couldn't stand up, yeah. particularly Rajiv Gandhi, uh, the scion of the dynasty of the Congress. He mobilized immense power and support, partly from capitalists who were uh, disenchanted with the Congress party, which yeah. they thought would further liberalization in India during the 10 years they were in power, and the head of a coalition in 2004 to 14. But also because Modi, of course, so he can mobilize a lot of that financial support. I mean, yeah. an unprecedented amount of money was spent during this election. <clears throat> but at the same time, he could galvanize the support of Hindu nationalist organizations, because he himself was part of that right. from the time he was very young. The most important being the RSS, yeah. which is the parent body of Hindu nationalism. So I think there was this, you know, I think the, he became popular because he articulated um, or he's presented a very powerful image of a strong decisive leader which at that juncture in Indian politics uh, people you know enough of the electorate sort of thought was very important to have when power was divided in the Congress between Manmohan Singh who was the Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and Sonia Gandhi who was the effective leader there was of course a spate of corrupt massive corruption scandals which really damaged the Congress party there was also uh, a sudden decline in growth. Congress suddenly, in the beginning of its term, had had this rapid economic growth, so that was catching up with China in terms mm -hmm. of its growth rates, and then suddenly you had a de-escalation, 2011 onwards. So declining economic growth, rising corruption scandals. Brazil is a much more serious case. Like India never went into recession. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, suddenly people felt like um, that, they, that this was a historic opportunity that, that the Congress was, was botching. The left, as you read in the book, and all those parties were fractious and disunited, they, they really sort of began to lose the plot. Mm -hmm. They just couldn't join hands. Um, and I think in some senses their politics were quite exhausted. Mm -hmm. So Modi sort of had this divided field, and, and he was able to capture power. But at the same time, it's important that the BJP only won 31% of the vote. Yeah. So, so he won a parliamentary a majority. Yeah. For the first time a party's done that since 1984. But he only won 31% of the vote. His star has really fallen. And there's a series of critical state elections coming up now in the two states where the communists had lost power recently, uh, West Bengal being a key one. And then next year will be the big one, which is Uttar Pradesh, the largest state in the country. And you know, right now, all bets are off. I mean, if Modi loses Uttar Pradesh, if the BJP loses Uttar Pradesh, like they lost Bihar, which mm -hmm. was the second biggest state, and they just lost it because the socialists, the two leaders of the socialists in that state, who couldn't stand each other for 20 years and therefore fought separately, yeah. joined hands to defeat him. If that happens in UP, then this incredible story that we read about 
is the beginning of its end. Right. right. And in 2019, maybe there'll be life for the book and we'll just be a history <laughs> book, we'll have another coalition. Yeah. I mean, do you think there's a, a lesson here that, maybe going back to comparative politics, that is useful to think about in other contexts, thinking about what we're learning or what you're learning in India in these cases? You know, that's a hard one. So in the conclusion of the book, I try to s put India in a sort of comparative mm -hmm. historical perspective. Um, and I didn't want to try to make a claim that, you know, s understanding India properly suddenly will illuminate all these other <laughs> places. I mean, that's a bit about, I mean, I think if, if somebody's able to do that as a comparative political scientist, fantastic. I mean, that's the kind of great works that we kind of look for. But, yeah. but I just couldn't do it. India was had too many distinctive aspects to it historically, institutionally, politically to allow that kind of generalization. Yeah. But I do think that um, to some things I've already sort of talked about a little bit, I think sort of institutional design in sort of complex societies, if you have a federal system, how you organize it, um, you know, th there's a lot you can learn from the Indian experience, right, about power sharing between centers and states, between parties. I think another lesson that sort of comes out that I do try to make, uh, I, I try to emphasize in the book is that we often think about regional parties as inherently provincial mm -hmm. and politically destabilizing, right? So yeah. if you're in Canada, the Bloc Québécois, if you're in the United Kingdom, the Scottish Nationalist Party, if you're in Spain, so on and so forth. And so our idea that the only thing that regional parties are concerned about and care about are their own constituents and their own boundaries. Mm -hmm. And, and, and in many cases, they have sort of, sort of deep secessionist right? yeah. uh, aspirations. And I think one of the things that I tried, this argument, I, mean, I discovered it, it's not like I had it in mind, I discovered it through the research, is that regional parties in India often have, a, despite what critics say about them, they do have a conception of India mm -hmm. beyond their state or province. They have a conception of the national interest, but it's configured differently. Mm -hmm. It's more decentered. It's more pluralistic. So one of the arguments that I was, that I mean, one of the things I've learned that, and that I tried again to emphasize in the book that surprised me, and I've been happy that some IR scholars that who begun to I've begun to engage with who work on India, so on foreign policy issues, of um, I've had an interesting exchange with some of them. And said, you know, if you look at these coalition governments that I looked at, the left-oriented ones with lots of regional forces, they tended to have a more conciliatory foreign policy towards Pakistan and Nepal in mm -hmm. particular. Yeah. Right, uh, and even Bangladesh, then either Congress governments or BJP governments, i.e., single party national, right. single party national uh, governments, right, or nationalist parties of various kinds. And so I think one, another lesson that comes out is that you know regional regionalism and regional parties are not inherently inimical mm -hmm. to a national vision or to a, a national interest, mm -hmm. but in fact, if anything. It might be more promising or progressive. Um, but in the conclusion, you know, when I was writing the book, so I started to say exactly the question you asked, like, what can you learn from India if you weren't interested in India? So <clears throat> there's a growing literature that says, you know, if you look at electorates in many parts of the world, um, even in the established democracies of the West, over the last 30 years, you see um, a growing regionalization, you, you see a decline of the traditional two-party mm -hmm. system, right? Now, in proportional representation systems of Europe, you, you hardly ever had two parties, you'd have two blocks. But, but there often would be like two standard bearer parties within those blocks, right? So the Christian Democrats, or the Social mm -hmm. Democrats, uh, for instance, uh, in Germany. And there's a lot of literature say that you know that stranglehold or that dominance of two overbearing parties over time has weakened. There have been new parties to the left and to the right of these major ones. And what we're increasingly seeing are coalition governments, not just in PR systems, which almost always have them, mm -hmm. because because right votes are proportional to seats, but even in places like Britain and in Canada. Mm -hmm. So when I was writing this, it was very interesting that. At the time I was finishing the book, in Canada they expected a coalition government. Mm -hmm. In Britain they expected another coalition government, like they had with the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives. You know, much to my misfortune of the book, in both places the electorate said we don't want coalition governments, and they elected these a majority in Britain and a majority in Canada. Yeah. But the general trends are there, and so I think one of the lessons that you 
if, if you fear coalition governments and if you fear regional parties for all the reasons I sort of mentioned, then I guess one takeaway would be that you don't have to fear them. In fact, in some ways, they might be more progressive. It'll look messier. Yeah. It, you know, visually, it'll look messier. Um, but sometimes that open negotiation and struggle and so on leads actually to a better outcome mm -hmm. um, and greater kind of consensus. And I guess the other issue I would sort of um, emphasize is, is more um, is about the importance of, as I, as I try to stress in the book, the importance of judgment in politics is something that, again, it, it wasn't something I, I wasn't interested in writing a book on judgment and therefore I wrote this one. It's something that came to me through my research. So almost all of the, I, I, in that sense I'm very inductive mm -hmm. in my work. You know, I sort of let the field speak to me in a sense, yeah. and, and particularly the people I interview. I use lots of different methods, qualitative methods in particular, but interviews are sort of the heart of most of the work I do. And I sort of take seriously what people tell you. And so when people said to me, we're not rational about this, we made a mistake. Mm -hmm. you know, in political science we don't talk about mistakes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Either, and you know, it's not only your rational choice there. I mean, others sort of assume that people have clear interests and they know what they're doing and perfect information. Perfect information. <laughs> and it's interesting, like, even if, so you can do that from the sort of liberal, rational choice perspective, but, you know, even many Marxist accounts are like, well, they're capitalists and they're workers and they have interests and they pursue those interests. Yeah. And it's all very clear and certain. And what struck me was when I was interviewing bureaucrats, politicians, you know, uh, leaders that were saying, you know, we, we messed up. So very famously, uh, in this period, the leader of the Communist Party who's offered the Prime Ministership and this party disallows him to yeah. take it, says, as you know, a year later, that was a historic blunder. Yeah. Now, the language of blunder is a language of judgment. Yeah, definitely. Right? It's a misjudgment. So I got very interested in the issue of judgment. And I think that's something I emphasize that, you know, judgment... Uh, Judgment matters a lot in politics, particularly in either very complex strategic environments like India and or during moments of change, mm -hmm. which is what I study. And if you bring the two of them together, then um, judgment matters a great deal um, because you can't assign probabilities of risk, right? These are uncertain times. You've been here at the New School for a little while, and as you know, the New School has a bit of a heterodox history and we're known for not only doing politics differently, but thinking about social research and social studies differently. Um, tell me a little bit about how does doing comparative politics here at the New School work for you? At, at present, probably what's interesting is that the, you know, the three of us who teach in comparative politics, uh, I think what, what we all sort of feel quite committed to um, is studying politics um, with deep area knowledge, mm -hmm. right? So really knowing places well, um, and a kind of commitment to kind of critical qualitative methods, but not to sort of juror other ones, right? Mm -hmm. But that's sort of the tradition. So, um, and I think I think all of us sort of share this f sort of feeling and idea that um, often you know, compared to politics, we sort of have theories and um, you know whether you're mainstream or heterodox, even sort of idea that well, you know, we have theories and then we test them against cases. And I think. I, I think I could say this for, for them as well, is that, you know, for all of us, the places we study are not just sort of cases for us, right? right? So although I'm trying to learn new countries, I mean, there's a very sort of deep political, emotional, uh, you know, spiritual investment in the kind of places we study. It's like they matter to us, right? right? You know, I, I, I read, like, try to read one, two Indian papers every day to keep abreast of what's going on. Not just so I can know, but because it matters. Right. And I think that's something that's sort of distinctive. So, like, we're very much about studying politics comparatively by knowing places and histories and societies really well to understand their politics. So I think that's something we want to try to emphasize in the teaching of the courses here. And I think at the same time, I, I personally, so, you know, we, as with everybody, and we have, we sort of see things slightly differently. And on a spectrum, I'm probably on one end of it, which is that at the same time, I was trained this way and I, I learned a lot from it. And I sort of, so I try to teach it similarly. I think it's really important to teach mainstream, mm -hmm. how, whatever you think that mainstream is, mm -hmm. approaches and texts and authors. And I think, you know, for two reasons. One, which everyone talks about, is practical. You know, you need to know uh, the literature that you're trying to distinguish yourself from. Uh, and also to show prospective employers when you finish your PhDs or when you're doing your, you know, whatever, whatever jobs you're trying to do or uh, work you're trying to do in the world, that you sort of know what the sort of mainstream or orthodox view and approach is. But 
But that's a practical argument. I actually think there's a more equally important, if not more, intellectual argument, which is that I think I've learned a lot from actually quite conservative thinkers, yeah. right? Um, one, because they challenge my values and my premises, mm -hmm. and two, even when I disagree with the values and premises, you know, some of them are just incredibly smart. Right. And, and I mean, this seems obvious, <laughs> right? But I do think that there's a danger of just reading um, the kind of work that, that we like to do, right. whether it's theoretical or political or methodological, mm -hmm. right? So, for instance, this book uh, you know, has a chapter about coalition theories and their, and their insights, but also their limitations. Mm -hmm. But so when I teach it, I think I, I have to teach it, but not just to set up straw men that I want to shoot down. Right. Because having finished the book, like I realize all the flaws and limitations of my own book. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of sense of having that intellectual humility mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that intellectual, having the intellectual humility and also the sort of having a theoretical pluralism, right. I think matters. And I think I try to teach a wide variety of perspectives because mm -hmm. um, I think students have to kind of come to their own right. judgments. Um, but I think what you, what distinguishes the field today in the department is this commitment to deep area knowledge, to to grounding our theories, and also with the view to thinking that you know we can generate new ideas and new theories from these places. Right. So I I've been really lucky and fortunate in the last three, four, actually more, five years with sociology for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there are comparativists in that department mm -hmm. like uh, Andrew Rato, Carlos Forment. Mm -hmm work on questions of democracy and law and constitutionalism um, in a comparative perspective. And I've also been lucky to kind of work with people in economics, mm -hmm. about comparative political economy. And I think that in a sense there's a lot of potential mm -hmm. for both faculty and students here to build those bridges between departments. Because one thing that really excited me about the New School when I was a student in the mid-90s when I used to look mm -hmm. through the catalog was this word that we often use, right? how interdisciplinary right. it was. And I think sometimes you need you need to build that institutional home, and by building those yeah. linkages, that kind of facilitate that. So hopefully that's something that we'll yeah. we'll pursue in the in the next few years. And I think that's for a lot of students. That's a draw, and I think maybe for prospective faculty as well is the thought that not only do you have the different divisions within the New School for Social Research interacting and thinking yes. creatively, but you also have other schools, Absolutely. design schools, yeah. graduate, you know, business yeah. schools, and environmental yeah. programs, and an undergraduate program, music, art, drama, in a sense, yeah. when you put all those together, it gives you a very creative synergy that uh, you know we NSSR wouldn't have by themselves. No, absolutely. In fact, I admitted that probably that, you know over the last two years that the one uh, group of faculty and division that I engage the most with in terms of workshops, conferences, um, is actually GPIA. Mm -hmm. You know, because there are a lot of scholars there who who work in the broad field of development. Yeah. Um, and actually, they have their own project on what they call sh uh, shifting social contracts or so new welfare mm -hmm. states. You know, and they invited me to come and give a talk there. And, and then we've been having an exchange of ideas. We were trying to work together on some various issues. Um, and so there's lots of room for that. And I yeah. think in some ways, um, we all belong to departments for you know, yeah. <laughs> good reasons, necessary reasons. But I think that if there's ways of exploring um, sort of connections between sort of groupings, with, I mean, you see it already happening, mm -hmm. right, in the department. There's very strong connections between our political theorists and philosophy, right? right? Um, some of the some in our faculty, even our comparative, have strong links with anthropology. Right. Or like you and your people are interested in the ethnography. So I think those kinds of horizontal linkages mm -hmm. um, are something that sort of happen now naturally and formally on a case by case, person by person right. basis, and something that we might try to to strengthen institutionally. Yeah, I think that's a good place to be able to try to do that here at the new school. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we're out of time for today, but okay. Professor Ribrelia, thanks for joining us, and thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again on another Research Matters.